I care more about an Ugnaught after one episode than all the characters of the sequel trilogy after two movies. I have spoken. <laughs> With November coming to an end, that means one thing. Time to kick back and spend some quality time with family, roasting a few porks for Thanksgiving. So what am I thankful for? My family, of course, and my faithful soldiers of the Empire, who tune in every weekend and help spread my words across the galaxy. And all of my brave heroes of the Empire, who donate their hard-earned credits to Vader Reviews. Your support is greatly needed and appreciated. What else am I thankful for? This new Star Wars series. It has been a dark time for the franchise, but they're bringing it back! Yes sir, good old Happy Hogan is making me pretty happy as well with The Mandalorian. Created by Jon Favreau, good old Johnny Favs, or as I like to say, Johnny Fave, because he is my favorite guy working on Star Wars these days. As those of you who follow me on Twitter know, Mama Shmi has Disney Plus, so while I was visiting family, I binged one of the best shows I've seen in years. And after I was finished rewatching Even Stevens, I decided to see what all the hubbub was about concerning The Mandalorian. Now I know many of you haven't been able to see it yet, so I won't do my usual play by play. I will, however, give my thoughts on certain aspects of the series, trying to steer clear of spoiler territory as much as humanly possible. But since I'm more machine now than man, no promises. Chapter 1 marks the live-action directorial debut of George Lucas's wacky cowboy hat-loving Padawan, Dave Filoni. And right off the bat, I have to say, it's very obvious Filoni and Favreau invited Lucas to set as more than window dressing or a PR stunt. This series has clear respect for the man and the mythology of the universe he created. I will admit I miss hearing John Williams' signature touch on the score, but with how well our new dynamic duo of Favreau and Filoni seamlessly blend the world of Star Wars with the feel of a Sergio Leone spaghetti western, Ludwig Göransson's music fits the tone of the series perfectly. Our story begins, as any great western should, with our lone gunslinger swaggering into a saloon like a boss. And as a local ruffian soon learns when you go up against a Mandalorian, your chances for survival are pretty much cut in half. Our hero, of course, being the manly Mandalorian, played with a Clint Eastwood level of cool by Pedro Pascal. And if they were holding a competition for the best new Star Wars character, I'd say, vote for Pedro. He's dynamite. After catching his latest bounty, who kind of looks like Ape Sapien if he let himself go, Mando here heads off to Apollo Creed's cantina for his next gig. And speaking of gigs, I guess the modal nodes just tore Tatooine, because I was expecting some kind of band in this wretched hive of scum and villainy, but I guess gritty bounty hunter bars don't care for wizard space tunes. What this series does so beautifully is explore the seedy underworld, or dark side, of Star Wars. I loved seeing the classic aliens and droids in this series, as it grounded it firmly in the galaxy we all know and love. We've got Rogan, we've got Koran, Trandosians, Nikto, the very man on the ice world is a Kubaz like Garindin, the snitch from Moss Eisley. We've got gonk droids, R2 units, TT8LY7 security droids like Jabba had guarding his front door. They even had a Kowakian monkey lizard roasting on a spit. Fun fact, Tony McVeigh, who created the original Salacious B. Crumb, puppet for Return of the Jedi, sculpted the monkey lizard for the Mandalorian, as well as many other aliens and creatures for season one. Back to the show. So Space Clint here takes a job tracking down a mysterious bounty on the desolate world of Avala 7 for some creepy old guy, but not before stopping by his old stomping grounds, the Mandalorian's secret hideout to upgrade his armor. Favreau proves he knows his Mandalore pretty good by incorporating the Beskar steel into this show. And besides the reference of the Mythosaur, whose skull adorns their tribal headquarters, a background Mandalorian is even wearing the armor Boba Fett himself wore in his animated Star Wars Holiday Special debut, showing once again, these guys know their stuff. While watching this show, I couldn't help but think, this needs to be a game, when the Mando is getting his upgrades. Can you imagine how wizard it would be, tracking around the galaxy, taking contracts from various underworld factions, while you upgrade your weapons and armor? Disney, please make this happen. 
Once Mando gets to Avala 7, he's immediately attacked by a couple of Blurg. A creature that looks kinda like a potato with teeth, or some freakish cross between a piranha and a fat T-Rex. But once again, props to Favreau and Filoni for bringing back the Blurg from the Ewok Adventure films. Interestingly, the design for the Blurg was an abandoned concept for the Tauntauns from Empire Strikes Back. Just when the Blurg's about to turn our hero into Mandalorian munchies, great name for a cereal by the way, again, Disney, make it happen. Something happens I never thought I would ever hear myself say. And Ognat rides up on a Blurg, and I absolutely loved it. Turns out a group of alien heavies have taken up residence on his peaceful little world, and he wants the Mando to clean up this town, so to speak, by dispensing some good old-fashioned western justice. Mando meets up with a rival bounty hunter IG droid, and as a youngling, IG-88 was my favorite droid of all time. I mean, 3PO was a great pal, but he was kind of a wuss, so seeing IG-88 in action was everything I've always wanted to see. The two of them join forces, leading to the coolest Star Wars shootout I've ever seen. I'm not even kidding. It made me want to go play Bounty Hunter all over again, just so I could take on Longo Two Guns. I'm four chapters in to The Mandalorian, and honestly, it feels like watching a great anime. I'm always left wanting more, and I can't wait to see what happens next. I've seen some people on Twitter complaining about this fact, but isn't this a good thing? I mean, actually wanting to see the next episode. That's something we haven't gotten from Star Wars in a while. In the end, The Mandalorian is the Star Wars television series I have always wanted to see. Charting new creative territory while remaining faithful to the original vision of Star Wars as created by George Lucas. The knowledge and love for the franchise is clearly evident, as well as the sincere wish to bring Star Wars fans of all generations something they will truly enjoy. A refreshing change, to say the least. So for its production design, thrilling action set pieces, stellar performance by Pedro Pascal, clear passion for Star Wars, and respect for its fans by Jon Favreau, Dave Filoni, and the entire creative team, I give this series 5 out of 5 Death Stars. The Mandalorian is impressive, most impressive. Join the Empire today, and together we will rule the internet. A link to our PayPal is in the description of this video. Donate today. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and hit that bell for notifications. And follow me on Twitter, at VaderReviews. As the noble Mandalorian so eloquently put it, it is the way. And always remember, you don't know the power of the dark side.